for having us, of course. Um, I know that we have a very short panel, so I'd love to just ask uh, both of our esteemed panelists to maybe just introduce your work uh, to the audience so that we can get to know more of you before we dive right into the questions. Maybe Professor Meng first. Thank you, Cynthia. And um, so, dear um, guests and interns, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I, this is the first time actually I learned about the uh, Hong Kong Life Sciences Society, and it's delightful to know that there's such a group uh, in Hong Kong uh, and uh, nurturing so many uh, young talents. So I come from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, I come from the engineering school. We call it the Faculty of Education, uh, uh, Engineering, sorry, Faculty of Engineering. And actually recently we've been working with the Faculty of Education uh, on AI uh, education. And you might have uh, seen in the news last week that um, one of the first, uh, I should say, I should say it's the first uh, pre-tertiary AI curriculum that we have written uh, for Hong Kong secondary schools since 2019. Uh, it has now been adopted by the Education Bureau. Uh, so the abridged version is going to be taught in all the secondary schools across Hong Kong starting in the new academic year. So it's really a, um, I find that a very fruitful journey uh, and working closely between engineering and education. And uh, again, I mean, AI is, is, is revolutionizing many, uh, many fields, and I think uh, life sciences is one, one of them. So I look forward to all the opportunities um, in working with uh, life scientists. Uh, so, so looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And Alan? Hey, good morning, guests and interns. It's my honor to be here today. Uh, so also, I understand that uh, nurturing talent is very important. I'm, I'm coming from uh, ASTRI. ASTRI stands for Applied Science and Technology Research Institute. It's the largest research institute uh, supported by the Hong Kong government. Uh, we have uh, more, more than 650 people and more than 500 researchers. Uh, we are taking care of researching in different fields, including communications, uh, IoT, uh, AI, and IC design, and serving multiple industries including smart city, we're serving uh, many government departments, uh, commercial corporates, and also uh, a lot of organizations in Hong Kong. Uh, some of our initiatives, including uh, FinTech, uh, digital health, uh, and also the smart manufacturing and so forth. So um, in Astrid, there are multiple teams and doing different things. And for my job, I'm taking care of a division called Trust and AI Technologies. As you may know, AI is very popular today. I guess uh, many of you, should have been using ChatGPT in some sort in your work, in your learning. And in fact, our group is also looking into that. Uh, we think generative AI is a very revolutionary uh, 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 technology and it will be applicable in many applications, including biomedical. So today, uh, based on our, our research and experience, hopefully we could have some sharing with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan. And so myself, I'm Cynthia. I'm currently general manager of the Mills Fabrica. We invest and incubate in startups and innovations uh, in the textile and food and agriculture tech uh, for the better of the environment and also the social uh, communities. But of course, today the spotlight is not on me. So I'm going to keep my intro the shortest uh, because I want to put the spotlight onto our Stephen panelists uh, this morning. And I strongly encourage you after all the discussions uh, for the interns, even, you know, all of us here to ask any questions that you may have. As you've probably seen the alumni video, the less shy you are, the more you get to learn from the experience. So make sure you have your questions ready. So um, of course today, the panel discussion is around AI and the influence of AI on our lives and our professional careers. I'm sure that, you know, as Alan and Professor Meng just gave us this very short introduction, we, I guess, it's not even a question. AI is very powerful. And very likely, many of us are thinking in our minds, particularly the young, young talents uh, on the floor with us today, um, it may displace, if not replace, some jobs. Uh, it may actually even create new jobs, new sectors, new emerging industries, which personally I find super exciting because it's daunting, but there's a lot of possibilities. So in general, I would love this question to go to both of you. What do you think in general uh, for the future talents? In fact, you know, I'm also carrying one in my, 
and <laughs> Billy, uh, definitely AI is not the future. It is now. So what do you think about this in terms of just future careers, professional careers and lives? Uh, and how could we leverage AI to elevate our work? Uh, maybe Professor Mong first. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia, for the question. So uh, surely uh, AI is going to transform the future of work. Um, so for example, there's a, a recent um, um, report uh, that came out from Goldman Sachs and it did a study. Um, and uh, I think they were saying that there are um, you know, hundreds of millions of jobs that are going to be uh, automated uh, wholly or partially by AI. So um, I would imagine that um, for many of the careers that um, are currently um, you know, currently being transformed, it's really uh, automation and increase of productivity. So, so for example, I have um, a friend of a friend, and uh, they, they have a marketing firm. So before, in one week, they produce four posters. Okay, and um, marketing, market, mar marketing uh, pamphlets and brochures, etc. But with ChatGPT, they're now producing four posters in a day. So that is an increase in, in fact, a uh, market increase in uh, productivity. Um, and if you look at the uh, Goldman report, it talks about um, emerging economies versus developing economies and the the transformation in developing economies is going to be very rapid. Um, and uh, in fact, in terms of raising productivity, Hong Kong had the highest bar in a bar, bar chart uh, uh, in terms of in, increase in productivity due to AI automation. So I would say um, in terms of the future of work, there will be jobs that are going to be replaced. Uh, there will be jobs that are going to be transformed. And in general, uh, this is going to raise um, productivity and bring our economy into the digital world. Thank you. So um, our task in Astri is actually trying to preach technology to different uh, corporates and organizations to use technology. And AI is one of the most popular one. In fact, in the past, uh, past year, we have been talking to so many organizations, including government, because I think now digital economy is uh, so popular. And I think uh, both the financial and the non-financial uh, industry are also, also looking into that. But in the past, we have been searching a financial institution a lot. So I, we understand that there are a lot of issues that can be automated, uh, that can be more precise and uh, reduce the risk. And therefore, we have been already developing a lot of application in that area. But I guess similarly, it could be applied to many fields. I get at the end of the, uh, of the day, uh, most of the tasks could be automated, uh, could be more precise, and to avoid the certain risk that human uh, exposed in the past. So. Uh, but in terms of the newer AI technologies, I think there are several fields could be much uh, uh, be used in that field. Example, uh, marketing is already m uh, can be using uh, ChatGPT or similar technology to enhance their work or content creation. Uh, not only on the marketing field, but also on the education side. Uh, I think in the future. Uh, Techno uh, education could be AI driven. Each of the students can make use of AI technology, understand their strength and weakness, and tailor made the education program for them. And for the teacher or the institutes, they can tailor make those exams or uh, evaluation techniques for those students as well. So I think it would be very useful in nurturing new talents in different fields, uh, not only on the technology, but also on maybe life science or, or even on the arts. Uh, education as well. So uh, I think it could be uh, used in many different fields, but technologists have to work with the industry, understand the pain points, so that it could better leverage those, uh, those technologies in their respective industries. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alan. Yes, indeed, we even see a lot of applications in, in textile and food and agriculture technologies as well. So definitely something that we have to think about eventually when you're also exploring the world of work, uh, something that, you know, deeply to be considered. So my next question, uh, also something that we may be thinking about, uh, and this question I'd love to go to uh, Alan, as you have uh, years of experience in cybersecurity, uh, risk assessments on applied uh, AI. So the more and more pervasive AI becomes, and obviously there comes a potential risk of potentially, for example, ethical and responsible uh, usage of, of AI. So we do hear some cases of you know, privacy issues uh, that spins out of the AI challenge. So what do you think about the risks? And could you share a bit of your insights and how could we potentially mitigate them? Okay. Uh, ethical issues of using AI have also been widely discussed in uh, recent news, if you ha may have heard about it. Even the world leaders are discussing whether uh, AI will destroy the world. But I think it may be too early to say, but I guess it's not impossible. So, but based on our uh, research or experience in the past, we find that there are uh, a few major risks that people often worry about, including the, the privacy. Because right now, we have to use a lot of data to train up the AI model, but it also may include your personal information. Uh, some people will worry about whether their uh, personal information will be misused in the other areas. So that is one big topic that we, ha we need to know how to make the use of our data. And then security, okay, whether your data would be stolen or even ordered for any illegal purpose. That we need to know how to protect the data such that it would be used securely as well. The, uh, the third topic would be the biasing. Okay? Um, since AI would be used to make certain decisions and even some important decision, no matter in financial or non-financial ways, um, whether it would discriminate, discriminate certain groups by putting a wrong decision on their uh, uh, financial investment or other purposes. Okay? Uh, and also the transparency. How do you come up with that decision? What uh, data or decision path that the AI model has been used? You probably would also know about. Otherwise, uh, it may generate some wrong result as well. So privacy, security, biasing, and transparency are the four most discussed topics on the AI risk. And then um, how to manage or, or, or manage the, the use of AI, how to protect the AI, how to develop the strategy such that make the best use of AI would be beneficial to humans. Not only displacing the job would be a worry, but how to make the best use such that it would be beneficial to all the, the, the owners of the data and to the company or to the society is also something we need to care about. And therefore, uh, many countries uh, in, and, and areas, including Hong Kong, has published some ethical guidelines in using AI. Um, I've been a technical advisor for the PCPD, and they have been publishing a, uh, ethical guidelines for implementing of AI, and there are several principles and practical use of these guidelines in their booklets. I suggest that people or companies who will be using AI or developing AI should have studied this guideline as well. It would be beneficial, but um, I think right now, there are still not many comp uh, countries having regulations on the AI yet because AI is have been advancing so fast and many uh, countries is also chasing the development of AI such that they could uh, uh, maybe making some regulation to protect people on using AI as well. I think we should keep an eye on that. So countries or, or different organizations who will be interested in using AI in the future should pay attention to this guideline as well. Thank you. That's very interesting. I'm um, actually curious to ask, um, do you think it would be eventually a must for companies and industry players to have, say, for example, an AI uh, ethical officer or if not data scientists in the team to make sure that what you've just shared there are protected? In fact, it's already happening right now. I guess most of the large companies has a data protection officer, but at the end, when AI is so vastly used in multiple areas, I guess at least how to do the data governance and also the strategy planning and the operation, they should have certain uh, trained professional or even certified one to manage these tasks. That's very interesting. So it seems like there's going to be a lot of jobs, even that, in fact, even new jobs that 
we currently cannot comprehend. So uh, again, for the young talents out there, something that we need to think a little deeper about. There could be just jobs and titles out there that we just cannot see right now, but things you know, with your exposure, uh, perhaps something you could drive with your passion and your determination. So my third question would go to Professor Meng. So yes, we have heard it all that you know, AI is extremely powerful. So, uh, so powerful that obviously we need to be a bit, little bit more prepared for what's to come. So how can we better prepare ourselves uh, and how could we leverage to the best uh, of its optimized uh, use so that we could balance the, of course, you know, maybe the, the, the things and the challenges that you know, Alan's just raised, but use it to, to the max and how we could leverage the best uh, of the AI world. Thank you, Cynthia. That's a big question. Um, I would say that um, for sure, I mean, as, as I uh, said in my introduction, I think AI literacy uh, for, for a whole populace is important. So what does AI literacy mean? Um, if you think about it, um, it's important for us all to have the knowledge, um, to have the understanding, um, and to have the skills, and most importantly, to have the to know the values in using AI. So, um, in terms of knowledge, we we must be um, um, aware of what are some of the technologies that are available and how they may be used. What are their limitations? They may not be perfect. They sometimes make mistakes. So we must all think, um, we, we shouldn't think that because it's high tech, it will always do the right thing, right? So um, we also need to think about the balance between um, um, human sort of in control versus um, uh, autonomous systems that can function autonomously. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, just echoing what Alan just said, um, ethical use, that's a big question. I think because we're among life scientists here, so what do you think are the most basic considerations in um, AI ethics, right? It's, it's really a question that all of us can think about. Um, you know, what is right versus what is wrong? Uh, what is good versus bad? what are our rights versus responsibilities, and how do we good, do good uh, to the world. So all these are considerations that all of us are capable of um, um, you know, putting in deep thought and also play a role in shaping uh, the future uh, where AI can be used. And, and also, um, I think it was just last week, um, Europe is really ahead of everybody, okay? Because Europe has the um, AI Act, Okay, so you're past the AI Act, it's gonna regulate, it's gonna ban, for example, the use of um, biometrics in public places, right? So that uh, people can't steal your fingerprint or your face ID, uh, so we're all protected. Um, if you're in Europe, of course, you'll be protected. Um, it's going to, um, for example, restrict um, generated AI generated content. You know, we talk about Gen AI being able to generate um, pictures like in Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, or generate music, generate speech. I work on speech. So um, um, AI generated content needs to be uh, restricted. Um, and if there is AI generated content, it somehow needs to be labeled. Um, you, you hear some news about. Um, because I work on the technology. I mean, my, my PhD student actually published the first paper in voice conversion that uh, received the best paper award back in 2016, right? So we're able to, for example, identify a target speaker and we get some speech data from that person, some, not a lot. And then we can use our uh, text to speech synthesizer. We can synthesize and get synthetic speech. So we can put words in that person's mouth. We can make the synthetic speech sound sound like the target person. Now, why did we want to do that? Uh, because we actually, in my lab, we do um, some technologies whereby we try to help people with speech disorders, 
right? We sometimes call that dysarthric speech, and it can come from people with stroke or Parkinson's or people with traumatic brain injury. So their the neuromotor control is not very good, so they can't speak very well. So you might, if you if you think about that, you might have noticed that dysarthric speech is the kind of speech that is uh, labored, but the intelligibility is very low. So we will then be able to actually transform the disordered speech into normal sounding speech. And so that is, the intent is for societal benefit because then we can enhance the social inclusion of people with such speech disorders. However, you know, being a double-edged sword, you can actually use the same technology in, in um, impersonation. Uh, so you might have heard a story where um, I think it was a mom who got a phone call from her daughter and, and, the, and the phone call claims that the, um, the, da the daughter um, is held captive somewhere um, and would only be released if the parents pay a huge sum of money. And then, so they were, of course, the parents were, of course, um, really scared. And then the father, it came to his senses that he should definitely call, try calling his daughter on her mobile phone. And lo and behold, the daughter is actually safe and sound and not being held captive by some bad people. So, so that's where, um, you know, the impersonation, being able to transform um, some synthetic speech into speech that actually sounds like some target speaker um, and, um, you know, do bad things. We, so we must be able to use um, uh, regulation to guard against that. So if we look at the, um, uh, the, uh, Euro the uh, Europe's AI Act, it actually bans, um, I should say, it restricts the use of Gen AI. It also restricts, um, for example, um, recommend, rec recommendation system on social media. You know, many of us who read content from social media, uh, we must be aware that there are these recommendation algorithms that capture what you like and what you dislike, and they try to keep pushing um, content that you like so that you can keep reading it. Um, but the flip side of that is if you, um, if every day we, we just read things that we like, then we lose the overall perspective of diversity. That's really bad because then we're basically living in an echo chamber. We need to guard against that. So, um, I mean, just a long story short, there's, there's a ton of examples whereby um, AI is uh, transforming our world and transforming, you know, our daily lives and we must be very much um, mindful that there's good side and bad side and we must protect ourselves and people we know and protect our world against, you know, the bad things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Meng. This is uh, very mind-blowing. Um, definitely knowledge which is power is in our hands and it really is up to us to, you know, use it for good or bad. And so this is also in the minds uh, our questions constantly being asked and something that we definitely need to deeply think about. So I know that uh, I could go on because I've got so many things I'd love to ask because I'm very curious, uh, but I'd love to open the chance to also to the floor, to the audience and see if you may have any questions uh, to ask both of these panelists. Uh, anybody? Just shout or <laughs> have your hands up. Okay, the gentleman at the back, please. Um, first of all, thank you for the very informative and, and inspiring uh, panel discussion. So um, just now Professor Meng talked about some um, regulations and like the boundaries for using, uh, for example, generative AI like ChatGPT. Um, I would like to know uh, what sort of regulatory standards should, for example, governments or scholars or um, specifically the developers for the uh, generative AI to adopt for um, like the better usage of generative AI. And uh, another question would be, for example, just now you mentioned uh, Twitter, uh, like um, uh, Elon Musk, uh, he actually canceled the um, uh, hate speech censorship or like filtering for the Twitter. Um, are you a supporter of this? Or do you think that um, in, in general, social media sh shouldn't have censorship or filtering? Okay, uh, 
Thank you for the question. So, um, so first of all, I want to share that uh, one of my PhD student, uh, one of my PhD students, is actually uh, conducting research in the area of toxic language. Okay, so there's um, a spectrum of toxicity in language and, and for that matter, really content. So for example, if you think about language, so the mildest form of toxicity would be um, impoliteness. Okay, so, and then the, the most extreme form of toxicity is where it's threatening you, okay? Um, and um, if you think about, uh, speaking of these uh, 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 chat GPT, um, if you think about it, um, it actually can do a lot of harm. So we were collecting data um, and we looked at toxicity in generated responses through chatting. So think about the following. Um, um, if someone type into ChatGPT and ask, um, so we did actually have a, an example like this, okay? Is death the solution to all problems. Someone type this in, okay? And imagine the context where the chat GPT will respond and say, brave and smart people often choose this route. Now, depending on who is on the receiving end, this, this response can actually be quite harmful, right? So, um, so, so that's where something like generative AI in generating language as it is chatting with a user actually can potentially lead the user to a, an extremely undesirable state, right? I mean, uh, what comes to mind is, for example, the movie Her. I don't know if you, we're, we have many young people here, maybe, you know, the movie Her was, uh, I, I think it came out several years ago, but it talks about a uh, a man that that fell in f fell in love with fell in love with his computer because the operating system is like a chatbot, right? So, so I think uh, toxicity in in language that is just wide open, you know, being generated um, as we speak in all shapes and forms must be regulated because it can potentially do harm. Um, Another thing is, um, if you look at, for example, the um, mechanisms inside ChatGPT, uh, there are three key steps, and, and they all work towards using machine learning algorithms that work towards generating language that is engaging. Right? You, you'd like to actually keep talking to it, and, and the language is very um, eloquent, I should say. Right? It, it can be actually spilling out nonsense, but the language is so eloquent, it, it sounds very convincing. So that is actually, and, and I must also say in all those three steps, none of those steps actually tries to ensure that the content is true or factual, right? So, so therefore there is this word called hallucination um, and ChatGPT oftentimes hallucinate, but you may not notice it because it's so eloquent, right? So one of the um, research projects in my lab, which is um, uh, an inno center uh, on AI, which is uh, named Center uh, for Perceptual and Interactive Intelligence. It's situated in the Science Park. So one of our projects is to um, try to inject some triangulation in the algorithm that, uh, enhances the, uh, the truthfulness in a uh, chatting robot, in, in something like a chat GPT, right? In our own, what we call, uh, in our own large language models. So we, we try to um, actually, before we produce the response, during the generation, the generative algorithm, we have various checks across a variety of sources that come out from information retrieval and we try to look for the commonality across different sources, and in doing so, we try to uphold the truthfulness of the generated response. So I hope those two lines of work can partially um, address your question. Thank you for the question.
I would like to make a response. Well, a compliment a little bit. Uh, I think uh, Professor Mong is the expert in the NLP area. I wouldn't want to like, boast anything that we are doing, but we are actually serving many chatbots to local companies as well. Uh, we are not using the largest language model as ChatGPT because, for one, uh, it may provide wrong answers, and the other is very expensive to use the models. Uh, I think right now Microsoft has been offering the open AI service, but still, every transaction, the token counts. So what we are doing in the past is actually we are building on a smaller model and train with their domain-specific knowledge. For example, on the financial side or on the government, certain departments' uh, local requirements. This will guarantee that on the responses will be uh, relatively true on the, the question being asked, and also it takes less computing resources to operate. And one most important thing, right now when you use ChatGPT, I think to some sort, when you ask question, it's disclosing some of your privacy information. Even though they sort of guarantee that they won't use for training, but no one knows. Okay, so whenever you're putting information to ChatGPT, somehow your information is disclosed. And therefore, when we are working on corporate uh, developing a ch uh, chatbot, we are make sure they're operating on premises so that all the information stay inside and all the secure information won't be leaked. And that's what we are trying to help the local communities. Of course, yes, please. Yeah, so thank you, Alan. I, I want to underscore those two points that Alan brought forward. One is sustainability, and especially because Cynthia is very concerned about sustainability. And I also feel that um, if you look at GPT 3.5, it has 175 billion parameters, and I think it took millions of US dollars to, maybe even hundreds of millions of US, uh, uh, US dollars to just train the model. And going from there, it takes another, you know, astronomical amount of money to pay for the electricity to keep the model going. Um, I also don't like the idea that of, you know, every person and, you know, every person or every company building their own large language models. I think it's very bad for our, our world in terms of a, a sustainability. Um, in, in terms of research, we're also, along that line, we're also, um, we, in fact, we just published a paper in May where we use an open source, seven billion parameter model, uh, open source model from uh, Meta, and we um, fine tune it with some domain specific data and we can find that it works just as well as GPT 3.5, right? Of course, it's not as good as GPT 4, but if you think about how much less um, energy um, or resources in general, compute resources, I think it's that, I believe in terms of research, that is the way to go. And, um, and also the other point that um, Alan mentioned on um, rightful use of content. Um, uh, GPT is trained on um, a, hu a huge amount of data um, on the internet, some of which has copyright. Uh, you, you look at mid-journey, right, or, or other um, uh, image generation uh, data, they, they, if they train on um, copyrighted um, content, they will generally produce copyrighted content. And um, so that actually is a violation of copyright. So if we look at the um, EU AI Act, the, the, the AI Act actually also regulates that. So the generative models need to train on um, appropriately, well, I should say, uh, it, it must not violate uh, copyright. It must uh, train on content that is, um, that is public and it's free for use, but not other protected content. And again, since we're amongst uh, young, young students here, uh, if you have a thesis or if you have a paper, do not, do not upload it into ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to help you polish it because once you do that, it's no longer your paper and it's no longer your thesis, right? If you look at, um, I, I think you might have noticed, um, I think several months ago, uh, Samsung, uh, engineers, they uploaded their code to ChatGPT to try to get it debugged and, and also uploaded some meeting minutes. All these are trade secrets. So therefore, there's a leakage of uh, trade secret content. And these are things that um, you must 
be watchful about. So I keep asking my students, you know, don't upload your thesis. Um, you, you can try to use uh, Alan's system um, and, and, and polish uh, your thesis and make the English sound better, but uh, don't, don't use ChatGPT. Otherwise, someone else in some part of the world may use the same prompt, and then they can retrieve your content, so it's no longer yours, okay? Thank you so much. So I did see some circular motions at the back asking me to wrap up. Uh, I'm sure that there will be uh, some questions uh, later, but we'll be staying for lunch. So please do grab us if you have any other questions that you'd like to ask. So just a really quick uh, wrap up from today's session. So I guess, you know, there's no question and no doubt that uh, AI is changing our lives, particularly in our professional lives. And so perhaps, you know, thinking of it that way, AI is you know, as Professor Meng said, replacing a lot of the jobs and particularly could automate a lot of the tasks that are relatively more, more, more mundane, maybe, more, more routine. Uh, and that leaves us uh, plenty of time for uh, other things that requires more creativity, uh, more things that are more complex that uh, a human brain uh, could definitely process, especially on the right and wrong and good and bad uh, perspective. And of course, on the ethical side of things, remember some keywords from Alan. So on the transparency, on the data protection, on privacy, and if not, you know, things, think, you know, things that really think of it from a more humanly distinctive way, what can uh, AI not replace is really our uh, human ethics uh, and of course not only that is also your passion so how would you want to leave uh, your professional lives it is still in your own hands and how could you leverage AI to elevate your work is always something that we could all think about so thank you so much I'd love to, uh, to have your help to have a round of applause uh, and thank uh, Professor Mong and Alan for this morning session thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>